So good afternoon to all of you. We are starting right now. Uh, this is part of the strategies for global leadership in the 21st century conference and is a session on governance. Uh, it is actually a follow-up to the opening uh, session that we had on multilateral, uh, multilateral organizations and governance. So this will give us an opportunity to deepen the subject with high-level distinguished panelists and presenters. Uh, I would start with uh, uh, Ivo Schlaus, who is uh, the, uh, an eminent scientist, but is also uh, the uh, president, the honorary president of the World Academy. Uh, Ivo, uh, you wrote, the world today can be destroyed in less than a day. Uh, this can, by error, by terror and stupidity. So uh, what, how to prevent this destruction? How do you think that we can prevent uh, the world for, from falling apart? And what is your theory, your general theory that you have so well en encapsulated into your paper? As you know, you have up to 10 minutes as, you, as to you to use it. Uh, thank you, Donato. Thank you, process. distinguished participants. Dear friends, do you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. Uh, the world as we have today, of course, uh, is based on what we call sovereign nation states. And this is everything in the United Nations, and people will speak later on on that, uh, is uh, also G20, G8, and there is about 300 intergovernmental organization, even the Bretton Woods structure was based on that and so on. And all treaties are also based on sovereign nation states. And unfortunately also, there are some, to use the well-known phrase, that are more equal than the others. The system that we have uh, originally is formalized at the time of the Westphalia Treaty, 1648. Next slide. And then, of course, uh, it has final form at the time of uh, Second World War. Uh, now we have to see, is that world uh, the same or it has changed? Can you, next slide. Uh, here you see a clear evidence that it has tremendously changed. Uh, the last part, actually in all indicators, socioeconomic and the earth system trends have really changed very, very much. Next slide, please. Next. Now, the world we have, as we have seen, is fast changing is global, whatever we want to do, whatever actually the effect of the uh, various infectious diseases will produce, and of course is interdependent. These are three basic characteristics of the world as we have it. The world is based on what we like to call democracy. So we would like to say that this is based on legitimacy and one of the essential part there is closeness between individuals and decision makers. Individuals don't seem to be happy. There is here the result of the poll in uh, UK uh, almost 10 years ago, and 62% of politicians tell lies all the time. Some of them 50 times more than the others. What is also very bad is that politics really still maintains what uh, Aristotle said is a master science. So it's extremely difficult. And most of the politicians as we have really work based on talent and not that much on knowledge. Much, much less than in any other profession. As a result of that, we can say that the natural capital of the world is badly destroyed. Now we see the sixth global extinction. We can say, find that is very good because it means we successfully went through five of them. No, for the world, this is the first. All the other were 
when humans were not here. It was before the human time. Human capital, of course, is terribly in problem, hunger, poverty, and so on, and this all increases uh, the precariat. Next slide, please. Now let us see how the countries, the sovereign countries are doing in terms of, a ship, uh, of efficiency, in terms uh, whether they respect the will of the people, and whether they lead the country in the wrong, in the right directions. The answer, unfortunately, is miserable. When you go and look at that, uh, less than one third of the population throughout the world uh, thinks that we are not uh, led in a right direction. Okay, the war could destroy our world as it is in less than a day. So this is the first statement, world can be destroyed in less than a day by essentially stupidity. I emphasize here the word can be, maybe it won't be. The next conclusion is that the world, the natural and human capital will be destroyed in next 10 years. Here is not can be, it is really will be unless we change our economic, social, and political paradigm. And then, of course, the humankind is entering into a phase of the continuous paradigmatic changes. Is not that we come to the end of the history. This is, as a matter of fact, a special phase of the history that is going to be just the same as it is. The last two decades of our life have been the best that we ever had. However, the next decade, we have a 20% chance will be worse than ever. Next slide. So we have one day, one decade, and of course, infinite and uncertain. And what is the methodology? Methodology is incremental. Uh, this is slow, step by step, paradigmatic. And that usually, though, we think of paradigmatic as something which is uh, occurring rather quickly, is not, and then is changing the leaders, and this takes even more. Sovereign nation states cannot and should not be eliminated, but they have to be changed. Now, let us see, in the condition of the free and fair election, what do we have? We have representative democracy, as we have today, direct democracy, which is essentially uh, the uh, referenda, uh, government led by the experts, and government led by the strong leaders. You see that essentially most preferred world prefers the representative democracy, but there is a lot of uh, uh, favor for the direct democracy, and of course, the strong leaders are not there. So one has to be very prudent about using direct democracy, and then the experts should never be subordinated to politicians. Elected politicians, diplomats, and strong leaders, in my opinion, should actually act as advisor to come back to the famous Aristotelian concept. Next slide. So my proposal is actually the following. Let us really make the mixture of all of this and almost the upside down. So let us rather than make the politics the master of everything, politics should also realize that it has its limits Science, of course, knows that very well, but politics also has its limits. For instance, let's take the case of the health. You do not go to a physician who is elected by the majority of people in your country. You know, you go to a physician who is really best in his very narrow field. We should do the same, we should use the same in addressing world uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction, 
world war and so on. So for instance, the Iran nuclear deal should absolutely not be in the hands of uh, several presidents uh, and leaders. The same story is with everything else. Of course, democracy needs participatory, anticipatory, and flexibility. And we have to realize that our country is not, as the 18th century phrase says, right or wrong, but always mine. No, my country is both right and wrong. Thank you. I think, uh, yes, it was, was great. Uh, it was really fascinating what you said, Ivo. You set the scene for this debate to uh, the higher standards, and we will continue, I'm, I'm sure, uh, along the same vein and the same tone. Uh, we now continue with Rama, Rama Mani. Uh, Rama is the Oxford University convener of inactive global transformation. Uh, Rama, uh, you said in your paper uh, that global leadership vacuum <coughs> needs to be uh, addressed uh, from a humanity point of view. What is this humanity point of view? in your uh, global transformation that you are representing. Wonderful. It is fantastic to be here and thank you. I, it's perfect to speak after you, Ivo Schlaus, because you've really laid us such a wonderful, exciting proposal. Um, well, since these are such mythical times and since you've put us right in the picture by saying I should present my human perspective, uh, since these are times of such planetary evolution and global transformation, allow me to start with a poem to answer your question directly, Donato, before presenting the rest of the main points of my paper. That morning, the child awoke and pointed to the rising sun. Look, father. His father looked. How the horizon burst slowly into crimson flames. He heard the eager thrill of morning birds. He felt the palm of his child on his cheek. As if for the first time. That day, in the cabinet of ministers, he announced, stop the shelling, end the war. Let us repair the damage we have done. Like a ripple on a still lake, the murmur of change spread. Other fathers rose in boardrooms and chambers of commerce. Stop the selling of our souls for profit. Let us sow the seeds of care. And others still, in assemblies and councils, stop this madness of division and plunder. Let us regenerate the earth and ourselves. At that, a low drumming was heard as mothers stepped forward everywhere. From every corner of the earth. Two billion feet danced the rhythm of life's heartbeat and strummed nature back to life. In their arms, they bore designs for the future. On their lips, they carried words of emergence and they joined hands with the fathers to form a steady circle surrounding the earth. And as the children played between their legs and as the youth came to fortify them, they began to transform yesterday's dystopia of I, me, and mine into today's outopia of we, us, and ours. Yes, that is how they began to create a world that's a true home for humanity, cherishing the indivisible family of life on earth. Well, in a sense, I could just stop with the poem because it's said it all, and I couldn't have imagined when I wrote that a few years ago, that this moment would come on the 75th anniversary of the UN born in the embers of the, the Second World War. And furthermore, let's remember the 30th anniversary of the end of the Cold War, which gave birth to the term global governance. 
So these are prescient times and your conference, uh, the, the UNAG was conference comes right when we would have been marking the signing of the UN Charter in June 75 years ago in San Francisco. And here we are at a time of unstoppable change to renew global governance. My introduction to global governance came with the Commission on Global Governance. And I remember the first many months as I reached out as external relations officer to academia, civil society, international organizations to seek their input, I simply first had to spend the first half hour explaining what the hell does global governance mean? And imagine where we are now. So what I want to say, though, about this report, which I hope some of you remembered, you know, last in the shadows of the 50th anniversary, when we presented this, our global neighborhood, it seemed a ludicrous camp, uh, concept then, but when we dare to make that the title of our report presented to the United Nations and simultaneously the World Economic Forum, all of the weighty proposals on global governance and UN reform were started with a call for global ethics as the foundation of global governance and ended with a call for visionary uh, leadership that would put people and the planet before self-interest and national interest. And here we find ourselves 75th anniversary and what a crisis we face. But I would say that actually COVID, as well as I add George Floyd's murder and the global call for justice, for the end to systemic injustice, actually are a fantastic opportunity for us, an opportunity to, to to see the opportunity hidden in the crisis and to really redesign global governance. So it's no longer a question as you asked Donato in the first session of uh, whether we should redesign global governance. It's we have to, we have no choice. That's what the people of the world are demanding. That's what nature is showing us. And it's also showing us it's possible as Ivo said, you know, we have that 20% chance of changing the paradigm. So the question now is by whom uh, where, when, how, and what. So let me just very quickly in the four minutes left cover those. By whom, since your conference is about transformative, uh, transformative leadership for global governance, it will have to be by transformative leaders. But what do we mean by that today? Well, COVID and Floyd have pointed towards the non-negotiable conditions for what makes a leader transformative. One, leaders who embody humanity and embody not just humanity in terms of values and being inclusive towards all humankind, but actually embody the unity, which is embedded in the word humanity, unity with all human beings, but unity with all life forms that populate and share this planet with us. Second is simply the, the notion which COVID brought home to us as we sat in our homes and observed nature come alive because we changed the paradigm of our lifestyle, which is we need leaders who recognize that this is our only home, our home planet. And if protecting and regenerating the earth planet is not priority number one for all leaders, from reverence and respect, we will not make it and they do not qualify as transformative leaders. The third condition for transformative leadership is it should be not experts in the, in the sense of academic experts. So I want to expand the sense that Ivo Slaus pointed to, but experts who have the experience because they have experienced the suffering, the injustice of what the system has done to them. But instead of becoming victims, they have transformed themselves personally transform the paradigm in their societies and thereby transform their societies. And I'm so grateful that throughout my life, I've had the opportunity to collaborate closely with such leaders from all different imaginable sectors, all the way from grassroots and youth movements and women's movements, all the way to the UN and international organizations. So those are the leaders, those are the creative capacities of transforming crisis into opportunity we need. So what else do we need then? The, the second question is the how do we do? this, right? And for that, I would say that this time, uh, it cannot be the way we've done past, you know, even the way the UN Charter was done at that time, the way we've done other UN treaties or national legislation. This really needs the collective intelligence, the creative consciousness of all of humanity from all of these different backgrounds coming together. It, 
it also cannot be done in the old ways because we cannot anymore meet you know, tens of thousands of us at one place. So it comes to the important question of where. And I would say that this time it's essential that it is not in those you know, conference halls, in those palaces where these terrible treaties that decided the fate of humanity without their participation by elites can happen again. This needs to be in the full transparency of Mother Nature because Earth is a major stakeholder. So it has to be embedded in nature and it has to be in homes because that's where we realize this paradigm change. But in homes which are full of that energy of transformation of people who have themselves been transformative leaders and have made this possible. And that, you know, Home for Humanity, of which I'm the co-founder, is an alliance of such homes. And finally, the what. And yes, so in terms of the how, I said the process would have to be very different from past processes, really a process which happens simultaneously in different homes around the planet, but is deeply interconnected and woven together as a web. And our Oxford and Acting Global Transformation has come up with a methodology based on actual processes of transformation in crisis-ridden societies where individuals and organizations and communities transform their crises into opportunities. And we've developed a four-step process, which I developed with my colleagues, witnessing reality, awakening possibility, envisioning change, and enacting transformation. And what's very powerful about this is while we are devising the new governance and enacting it, actualizing it, we are also transforming ourselves and we are learning by doing, learning by becoming how to be transformative leaders. So it can become a school for the continuation of transformative leaders. So I'll end with, well, what? You know, we will need to go beyond the UN Charter simply because we couldn't have imagined then the world we would live in now. Uh, we already have Many, we are not starting from scratch. We have a lot to build on. We have the Earth Charter. We have many other such very powerful expressions of designs, practices for the future. And in our own case, with drawing on many, many of our colleagues, we came up with what we call the Humanity Charter, which embeds the word unity and some of its key principles, which I can only highlight now, are talking about the unity of all life the earth as our sacred and shared home, renewing a culture of humanity based on our diversity and our unity, drawing on ancient indigenous and emerging knowledge uh, to shape the future and creating an inclusive earth civilization through our collective and courageous actions. So I end with that and I think it's an exciting time for us to work together. So thank you to WAS and to UNAG for organizing this event at this moment. Thanks. Great, fantastic, Rama. Thank you for your spiritual approach, your ethical transformation that you are promoting, and uh, for the seeds of care that you are also planting. Now, uh, pass the floor to Alexander. Alexander, you're there. Good afternoon. Alexander, um, you will present your, your paper, Global Leadership in the 21st Century. Uh, I, I'm particularly interested in learning from you why you say in your paper that we have not learned the shocks of the 20th century and also uh, with a very interesting analogy uh, you said that we are like adolescents that we uh, outgrew our jeans uh, our, our uh, you know our trousers in that sense could you tell us why i mean what why uh, why these trousers don't fit anymore over to you you have to unmute yourself, Alexander, sorry. Sorry, you have to unmute yourself. Let's start. Yes, sorry. Thank you, Donata. You've just found the pearls of the text <laughs> to, to, put, to, to base your questions on. You know, um, I, I will answer to your questions and I will address that. But first, I, don't, I just wanted to say that I do not want to described the paper which was converted um, in their article and those who would want will be able to read it at, at the Cadmus magazine. Uh, you know 20 years ago when we were just celebrating the new millennium during the new year party one of my friends rose a toast and uh, he said that in the new century we are bound to be better off than 
in the previous one because we so messed around with it that there is only why, one way up out of this situation. My response was not that optimistic. I said, a lot of people think that way, but that's the triumph of hope over experience. And uh, uh, it would be more rational to suppose that because we made mess with the previous century, as we have made mess with everyone before this century, we will continue going on making the mess. So far, the reality seems to be much more likely to my scenario, unfortunately. However, let's look at least on the current modalities and option how to make the, how just to avoid making the mess. I have singled out two questions to, 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 to focus. The first one, how foreign policy is made? Who are the authors? What are the assemblage points, if any? Who are the main stakeholders, actors, and protagonists? A ministry of foreign affairs is a very traditional place where men in suits analyze international challenges and find answers in a very closed circles. Right? Think again. Who are the authors and where are the assemblage points? Let's look at the United States. The Department of State is designed as the agency to lead in the overall direction, coordination and supervision uh, of American foreign policy and foreign relations. White House, in addition to that, adds its influence and the National Security Council. Congress also has a role in American foreign policy. The Senate provides advice and consent to all treaties and many committees in both the Senate and the House of Representatives have oversight on issues relating to foreign policy. Of most important are the impacts of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations and the House Committee on Foreign Affairs. A whole lot. Where is the assemblage point? Similarly, the situation in France and UK. Is it then really a state-run policy or continuous crisis management tool that we call foreign policy? Why we monitor all the more and more externalization of domestic politics? In uh, the John Bolton book, which is going to be published in about a couple of uh, days, he is saying Trump's foreign policy rested on political gain. I am hard pressed to identify any decision that wasn't driven by re-elections, re-election calculations. That's his words. You know, 100 years ago, in the days when diplomatic summits followed wars and carved up continents and sometimes lasted months, today, by the way, the attendees complain if they run past midnight at different sessions. And the famous British diplomat, author, diarist, and politician, Harold Nicholson, attended the Paris Peace conference as a junior UK diplomat. And his conclusion was, amateurish diplomacy leads to improvisation. Nothing could be more fatal than the habit of personal contact between the statesmen of the world, Nicholson wrote in his diaries of the 1919th talks in Vienna. Diplomacy is the art of negotiating documents in a ratifiable and therefore dependable form. It is by no means the art of conversation. And the post Second World War global governance system has been built on ratifiable 
and therefore dependable agreements, UN Charter, all the institutions of post-war global governance, Bretton Woods system, you name it. Now fast forward a century and things could not be more different from what Nicholson prescribed. Global leaders are carrying out foreign policy by Twitter. US President Donald Trump, Trump is improvising summits with North Korea Kim Jong-un, writing crudely worded letters to Turkey president, proclaiming in the home of multilateralism, the UN General Assembly, that future does not belong to globalists. Across the Atlantic, meanwhile, French president Macron is scrapping G7 communique because no one reads them, even as he freelances on Iran, China, and NATO calling the last one brain dead. The traditional global governance is increasingly sidelined by the era of quid pro quo diplomacy. Or worse still, singled out by political leaders as part of a deep state that wants to subvert the will of the electorate. It looks more and more that all is becoming transactional at diplomatic level. Trust is being undermined. Trump handpicked ambassador to the European Union, Gordon Sondland, was being hauled before Congress to explain his role in the shady diplomatic dealings in Ukraine. And he said that his mission was to destroy the European Union. They say that a German diplomat with a more traditional view of an ambassador's role muttered when he heard this. That's the opposite to the job description. So the second question is, what are the new world contours that we're living today? First one, I think it's a rising prominence of alternative forms of collective action as complements to and often substitutes for traditional intergovernmental cooperation. MAP ceased to be two-dimensional in which only the state uh, sort of based on the post-Westphalian sovereignty world Rule. States may continue to negotiate and collaborate within conventional bodies like the United Nations or the other institutions, but extensive policy coordination also occurs with, within parallel frameworks that are ad hoc and temporary rather than formal and permanent. These institution, institutions are often minilateral as I don't remember who coined this word, rather than universal. They are voluntary rather than legally binding. Think about Paris Climate Agreement. Disaggregated rather than comprehensive. This is topical Berlin UNFCCC. Transgovernmental rather than just intergovernmental. Cooperation today based more and more on loosely structured peer-to-peer -peer ties developed through frequent interaction rather than formal negotiation involving specialized domestic officials. Typically, I'm talking about regulators' role today, directly interacting with each other through structured dialogues, memorandums of understanding, and so on and so on, often with minimal supervision by foreign ministries regional rather than global, multi-level or multi-stakeholder rather than state-centric, and bottom-up rather than top-down. COVID-19 has so far re-established the power of national governments. It seems so. Borders have gone up across the European continent and the response everywhere was defined by variety rather than unity. Sweden opted for a very lax approach Many countries were much harsher than in that. Emmanuel Macron uh, deployed the uh, administrative resources for that Hungary authoritarian 
Prime Minister Orban exploited the pandemic for an outrageous power grab and Germany tested its way into a position of comparative strength. But on the other hand, does anyone doubt that digitalization, global commerce, global flow of humans, plants, animals, and infectious diseases among that will continue? Besides, public health does not stop at geographical borders. Then, if not nation states in the post-COVID world, then what? Changes to the global order, which are already mature, take us into the unknown. The future of global governance might very well look like a co-working space to me, where collaborative brainstorming formats are organized to tap knowledge and ideas of creative minds from all walks of life. And uh, I want to conclude my introduction by uh, uh, introducing to you two bottom-up initiatives. The first one, Volunteer Think Tank for us, the Swiss Forum on Foreign Policy, which is a crowdsourcing ideas and knowledge of hundreds of young foreign policy pundits. And the second one, the Open Situation Rooms, the first grassroots think tank which enables ministries of foreign affairs and international institutions to tap the problem solving capacities of creative people. For ours, it's a grassroots organization and it's a platform to give a possibility for young people to publish their ideas and to spread their ideas regarding uh, the foreign policy and international situation. Currently, more than 1,000 members are contributing their ideas and it's spreading. Uh, the more, I would say, the older initiative is the case of the open situation room, the German one during crisis in foreign policy, it used to be the most senior officials of, an, of any administration that are assembled in the situation room, a sanctum sanctorum, place where all available information is gathered and made available, where the chain of command are synchronized and where decisions were made. And today in the open situation room, Around the table are not only senior officials, but also young entrepreneurs, scholars, physicians, designers, artists, and social activists. Instead of sitting and discussing, they are calling Facebook friends that are on site. They are designing prototypes of foreign policy reactions by entering role plays while at the same time are tweeting live from the OSR. At the end of the session, they present a range of scenarios and recommendations to decision makers. And I know from the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs that now it considers it a very important source of the information. Networked world needs networked governance. You probably remember that uh, uh, after the death of Charles the Seven, no, after the death of Charles VI, Robert Cecil, no, uh, in France, of course, uh, that was uh, the famous wording, le roi est mort, vive le roi. The king is dead, long live the king. And Robert Cecil, one of the architects of the League of Nations, famously concluded his speech at the final session of the League of Nations with the phrase, the League is dead, long live the United Nations. I am afraid that probably we have reached the point where we will need to say I'm not saying that United Nations is dead. Obviously, it will continue, but it ceases to be 
the only sacred container of global governance. Thank you very much. Alexander, I think I forgot to introduce you, not that you need an introduction, but for those who may not know you, you are a professor at Geneva School of Diplomacy uh, and a fellow of the World Academy. But more than that, uh, you are uh, an authority in really in the field of politics, not just an historian. Uh, when you mentioned this very interesting book of 1919, <clears throat> You made me think of another book that uh, somehow also was foretelling what, it, what happened in, in history. And this book was uh, from Arthur Kostler. You certainly know this book. It's uh, Dark at Midnight, an Hungarian uh, author that I think shaped many, many among uh, our ranks in terms of uh, uh, how to analyze dilemmas. Uh, and uh, um, I think that this brings me to the next speaker immediately. The next speaker can only be Tibor. Tibor, are you there? Uh, not because you are Hungarian, uh, but because I think you are the best person to talk to, to us about uh, distributed leadership. Uh, one of the concepts Alexander hinted to, um, uh, of course, a transformation that has to happen uh, through a network uh, uh, style government or governments. Uh, so it's not a matter of improvisation anymore. It's, politics is not just peer to peer, but uh, you hinted to distributed leadership in, in, your, in your paper. So we would like to hear more about that. But I also have a subsequent question for you, since I know you uh, from, uh, uh, I remember you in the early 90s, when you were championing the Chemical Weapons Convention, and then we set up the Chemical Weapons Organization, C uh, OPCW, uh, to, to halt uh, the production of, uh, of this class of uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction. And you remember we were talking about uh, organizations that were tigers without teeth. Uh, and this uh, was uh, something we were trying to preempt huh? As, uh, and, and, and not fall into, again, the trap of creating tigers without teeth. But many of the organizations in reality uh, that we have, this constellation of international organizations, in one way are tigers without teeth. And the leadership, uh, it, sometimes, you know, they are isolated in their ivory, uh, ivory towers. They do not understand how to really manage an organization through the distributed leadership that instead should accompany a transformation of like, such as the kind that is required in contemporary world. So up to you, Tibor, to, to tell us uh, how do you see things uh, happening? And again, how can you answer these two questions, if you may? Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Donato, for turning upside down uh, my thoughts, but uh, I, I would be marching alone. Uh, with your request. So uh, le let me start with um, the reference point you used. And the reference point is somewhere in 1992 when uh, that uh, Chemical Weapons Convention was born and 1997 when it entered into force. So we are speaking about the uh, middle of the 1990s. And I think it's absolutely relevant for our discussion because uh, based on the way I look upon the more recent history of security, probably the entry into force of the Chemical Weapons Convention and the birth of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty were the last moments, if you wish, when what I call cooperative security uh, relying on, on cooperative arrangements uh, ran its course and was overtaken from that moment by what I call coercive or competitive security. And since that time, um, that cycle of uh, coercive competitive security is still going on. Uh, it 
brings up, of course, the, the important question Alexander raised, the, the 1946 reference to Ceci Rhodes, um, the League is Dead, Long Live, the United Nations. And uh, already, already in, in our opening, I, I try to differentiate between uh, a tabula rasa type of new beginning, which, which did happen uh, historically. And one was uh, the, the 1945-46 takeover by the United Nations. And in a way, the League of Nations. But these tabula rasa solutions were preceded by unbelievable calamities. And uh, if I go back one step further, the, the Vienna Congress of 1815, which, which was the setting the previous um, uh, the lineup of, of security through the Congresses. So I, I would like to believe that uh, whatever we have, we have to make the best choice, uh, best use of, of those um, frameworks, organizations, and I fully agree with all the points made by Ivo, by Rama, uh, and by, by Alexander. And my feeling is that we have to put our eggs in as many baskets as it is possible. Why? Because we might be right now, and I don't know and no one knows, but we might be in the eye of a really big storm. I don't think under certain scenarios, we, we see this uh, complex uh, 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 intersection of challenges, uh, which uh, from, from a global health challenge is pushing us into a economic, slowly financial and, and other type of challenges on the top of this ongoing secular uh, competitive security um, uh, bubble building, building, being building, being built up. Uh, in a situation uh, like that, on one hand, we can be opportunistic and uh, use the phrase of uh, what was used by Churchill as well, never let a good crisis go to waste. Uh, and, and probably we will have to do that because in a situation like that, instead of less international cooperation, and international cooperation is representing regulations, and I believe in right-sized regulations, not regulations overdone. We need more regulation than before. And it is the problem because as we look upon the cycles, uh, the, the re reference point of 800 years of financial folly is the booms and busts repeating themselves and the regulations are pro-cyclical. They are coming too late. And we have the same problem in security that the regulatory part is coming after, the day after, okay? Post-bust, post-World War I, post-World War II post napoleonic wars so so we have we need more we need more regulation more cooperation in the middle of a storm approaching and the only way to do it is to make the best use as well of we have while trying to build something new and let me use the example of the first half uh, of the 1980s compared to the second half. In the first half, there was a very, very serious close call type of confrontation between the US and the former Soviet Union, which led somewhere in 83 uh, to the realization that things can totally run out of control. And it led to something we started in Geneva, 85, Reykjavik, 86, 
the INF Treaty. And this enabled us, this investment in cooperative security as one of the contributing factors to go through the transition in 1989, 1990, 1991, the way we managed relatively peacefully. Because the type of geopolitical and other changes which happened there happened only in the aftermath of big wars and major calamities. So this type of investment like we saw in the, in, the, in the second half of the 1980s is needed. And the Chemical Weapons Convention was one of those investments, which created uh, a, 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 sufficit, a sufficit of trust co compared to the deficit of, of trust, which was needed at the moment when, again, somewhere in October 89, uh, the, the whole transition started. Distributed leadership uh, might have different levels. So one level is, of course, countries should do their best bilaterally. Uh, have a look what's happening uh, between India and China right now, okay? And uh, everything possible should be done in a sub-regional context, but where I am coming from, and this is more the intergovernmental global setting, I would like to underline the following element. Number one, all of these organizations will have to be more proactive. And the organizations are, of course, representing the nations, the members. An organization is as strong as the weakest wheel of the nation, uh, which is not ready or able to join the, the mainstream consensus. So in a, way, in a way, there is a need to expose all nations in, in those organizations that unless we do things differently, this time will not be different uh, compared to, to, to what um, Sassy Rhodes put on the wall uh, back in 1946. In addition to, to, to let the real masters of the organization know that we have to do things differently, we have to be aware that right now the leadership, because of the crisis, is being more and more concentrated. We are potentially back to the late 19th century when sovereigns and emperors in one hand concentrated so much power with the possibility of making the right decision, but with the major risk of going the wrong direction without the checks and balances. So we are back to that time and we have to, we have to turn it around towards distributed leadership where this distribution is happening through intergovernmental organizations. This uh, distribution is happening as a result of more cooperation between different organizations. Why? Because they are too much compartmentalized by their mandate, and this is their advantage. But in a situation like, like we have right now, it's absolutely clear what is the link between, for example, the World Health Organizations and the International Labor Organization, and uh, the link between health and unemployment. And what is the link between the international labor organizations and the world trade organizations? Because countries are moving towards the uh, beggar your neighbor policy, trying to balance the situation with, with doing less trade with partners. And then we can see what is the link uh, in this uh, continuum between WHO, ILO, and WTO, and the security organizations, okay, which, which are slowly, slowly falling apart. So I, I think there is a need somehow without overstepping mandate to take care of that. Distributed leadership, and this is where I, I stop, means that within the organizations, there is a need to remove the uh, gerontocracy of those organizations. Let's, let's call it bluntly, okay? It, it cannot be like people only having served 30 years in an organization are the depositories of the wisdom. Women, there is a need to move women 
uh, into, into defining positions, women who are better in doing cooperation. It's, 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 there are so many studies uh, on that. Uh, the young generation, in, in the previous uh, discussion a couple of days ago, I made the point that if we lose this generation of the millennials, we might be back to the 1920s when the, the young generation was lost as a result of, of, uh, of continuing crisis, economic and so and so on. So we have to mobilize. We need uh, new contributors. Uh, it was mentioned by Alexander, it was mentioned by Rama from outside. We have to open up the gates of these organizations to embr embrace new technologies, to embrace uh, new types of, uh, of mass collaboration. So I, I think instead of, instead of um, declaring necessarily that, that we have to replace these organizations, we have to make the best in a situation where it's not a crisis, which uh, shouldn't go to waste. It's not just in plural crisis, but it is a super bubble. It is a super bubble potentially in, in the eyes of which we are right now. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you, Tibor. Thank you for going beyond the, your, your paper that is extremely important leadership requirements in the midst of beggar dry neighborhood, uh, neighbor crisis policies. Sorry, this is the title of your paper that is going to be published, if not already published in Cadmus. Uh, and uh, you, you, again, you address the, uh, the whole points that we wanted to, to hear, uh, also giving us a sense of what changes need to be impressed into this uh, present course of action that otherwise is doomed to failure. Um, I really enjoyed what you said uh, in terms of this renewal that is necessary uh, and, uh, and certainly this miscommunication uh, among international organizations where they stick to their mandates many times, but there is no dialogue. I mean, and this is, uh, we have seen so many times. So thank you for reaffirming this very important point that is on top of our agenda. Tibor, Executive Secretary Emeritus of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization. Tibor Top, thank you. The next one to speak will be Mm. Uh, Pascal Petit. Pascal is uh, uh, director of research emeritus of the Centre d'Economie de Paris Nord and also a fellow of the World Academy. His uh, paper published as well um, in Cadmus is uh, the midst of successive crisis lessons of the 2020 health crisis. So you do concentrate Pascal on uh, um, issues dealing with the, the also COVID and post-COVID situation, but also you, um, uh, you, have, you have some lessons that you have uh, distilled for global governance and national policies in order to avoid disastrous outcomes. And also you reflect on past failures, uh, the, the fact that we were not able to learn from the financial crisis of 2008, for instance. So Pascal, the floor is yours to illustrate uh, your, uh, your paper and your further reflection. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Donato. I'm very interested to take part in your panel in the whole conference, but I must say, uh, I'm a bit depressed also by some of the previous presentation depressed because they are right in many respects, except that if we imagine that we go to Geneva uh, next, uh, next fall with such a view, we will lose part of the momentum that you can exploit. I will try to be not more optimistic, but in the world of uh, Tibor, to say that if we don't plan big change before the event, we can take lesson from past things to kind of move uh, forward some more, let's say, positive type of action. I will try to help myself uh, uh, with uh, PowerPoints. Uh, is that correct? Do you see it or? No, we don't see it yet. Uh, what do I do for that? 
Is that? Yes, it's opening now, yes. I know, that's Zoom. That's something else. Uh, you'll have to sorry? select the power, you'll have to select the PowerPoint application. Yes, uh, but I am in, in that. Uh, normally, I see on my screen my PowerPoint. We see your browser right now, Doctor. Can you take, can you pick it up or? Uh, can you please try again? After you click on screen share, when all those windows pop up, select the PowerPoint application, please. Yeah, uh, I select the PowerPoint application. Let me see. This... First, the share screen button. Huh? First, you click on that share screen icon. Uh, at the bottom, the green one. Yeah, so I, which I had done previously. Sorry for that. Here I am. A number of your applications that are open will show up. And in that, you select the PowerPoint file. Uh, Is yeah. the PowerPoint open? Yes, it is supposed to. I'm sorry for that. Now we see the browser right now. Okay. So I, I'm sorry for that. But, uh, do without the PowerPoint because I think we, we, we don't want to lose the momentum. Otherwise, I would pass yeah. Robert, Robert Covey that I see. Good. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Uh, maybe, uh, I'm sorry for that, but that's... Uh, double I, click on it, yes. Do you, do you have it? Can you see? No, you'll have to open that PowerPoint now. Yes, it is open. Sorry, uh, sorry, administrator. I would like to pass the floor to the next speaker, and then we will do it later on. If you can kindly arrange the the or uh, Pascal, can you do without the presentation? Yeah, I. Uh, it's much better with the presentation. That's, uh, well, now we are into the debate, and I really would like to continue. Okay. Uh, well. Okay. So okay. Robert, uh, you can, well, you can you can uh, work it out and then we continue with Robert as you do prefer. No, continue with Robert, I guess, and I will try to. I can send it to the administrator also. So. Is that good? Uh, uh, Robert, are you there? Uh, uh, Robert Kevy. I'll message you. Uh, please, sorry, I would like to continue. Robert Kevy is the partner of Praxis and he wrote a paper Global Leadership in the 21st Century. A micro perspective. Robert, you are associated with the uh, Carnegie Institutions for Peace. Uh, you can tell us a bit also about yourself. Um, you are new to us as the Academy, but not new to many uh, commentators and people who uh, follow international uh, policies uh, and, and, and politics. So Robert, uh, your, your, as you said, your, your paper takes into account the micro perspective, not just the, the, the larger picture um, so you, you of, the global, of the global leadership, but you also enter into a micro perspective. Uh, you somehow follow also the small winding up roads that Robert Oppenheimer uh, mentions in his paper uh, so many, many years ago, uh, uh, that for us is a reference also in this conference uh, so, you know, in, 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 in lieu of the super highways that could be used to uh, target the problems of leadership nowadays. Uh, so, uh, from Robert Oppenheimer to you, and to tell us, uh, Robert, uh, how do you see global leadership in the 21st century shaping up? What are these micro perspectives? All right. Um, the. Uh... The, the paper, which as with the others are being published, I, it didn't make sense to read that, but I do have um, a few propositions, I think, that the paper lays out. And a couple of passages that I'll probably read because they were tightly enough written that, um, uh, that, that we can cover a lot of ground quickly if I read a paragraph or two. But the broad prop, first of all, you asked about me. I, compared to the, the extraordinary group that you've assembled here. I'm, I'm a little bit more of a mongrel. I started out as an academic, spent about 10 years running 
conferences on international development policy for ambassadors, U.S. business leaders, that sort of thing, U.S. government officials, and spent 10 years working for the CEO of a multinational, um, and then finally went to the Carnegie Endowment and has since set up a first day, a little research organization, and now a consulting organization that's helping the UN with the sustainable development goals, especially the, the goal of sustainable energy. Um, and now, now we're getting a little into the weeds, but energy through uh, high performance buildings. Turns out that if you can get the buildings right, you might be able to get a lot of other stuff right. But another, um, well, in doing that, I focused in on some educational principles. And, and that's really what this paper is about. Um, the broad proposition, and again, I, there's been a lot of discussion today of, of a whole bunch of dark stuff, but it includes, you know, the, 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 the grand strategy issues. And um, they deserve to be front and center in a conference like this. I'm a little off that track in this paper, uh, but I'm interested especially in the sustainability questions. My, the propositions of the paper you could reduce to this. Number one, the grassroots will will need to be a source of leadership, a, a, a very active source of leadership. On the one hand, they can put a lot of sand in the gears of whatever progress it is we're trying to make. You can't make 7 billion people, soon to be 10 billion people, do what you need them to do by telling them. If they don't want to do it, they're not going to do it. Um, and at the moment, a fair number of them don't want to do it. On the other hand, with that, the vision that underlies the UN 2030 agenda and the sustainable development goals that go with it, um, that is a deeply humane vision. And it projects out a deeply humane future. I don't think we can coerce humanity out of people. We have to cultivate it. We have to find ways to cultivate it. And that's, that's a good deal of what this paper is about. Um, the thought is that that question of how do you go about that, I, don't, I think it's fair to say that's not really been done before. Um, and if, if you need it and you don't know how to do it, that could lead, you could, you know, thinking that through would take you down something of a dark path. But um, we have some experience here in the States today, right, we have some experience. I'm more familiar with states. Uh, some experience in trying to get that done. And specifically some, some uh, experience through the American Civil Rights Movement, which looked out at a fairly dark future and was able to make a difference. Um, and the, the piece of it I want to grab today has to do with certain kind of adult education that requires certain kinds of teachers and certain kinds of students. You might put teachers and students in quotation marks for this purpose. Um, and at the end of the day, those, that grassroots, those, those students might end up meeting both the kind of street level, what you could call street level activists that, that you saw in those marches during the civil rights movement, but also the professions because of the nature of our problems now, the, the professions or the professions reimagined might be very important. So those are the four basic propositions. We're going to need the grassroots. The question of how to cultivate the grassroots is going to be very important, and it's ans the answer to that is not obvious. The civil rights movement might give us a few hints, and uh, it'll be not only street-level activists, but professionals that will be, we, we might want to target with that. Now, from there on, my talk is rather a relaxed one compared to, compared to the others. I'm going to tell a couple of stories, and uh, I'll keep an eye on the clock. I think I used up about two minutes. When I run out of time, I'll run out of stories. Uh, but the first story is about something that happened on the Sea Islands off the, right at the coast of South Carolina in, in the 50s. Um, the Sea Islands were... You know, essentially, the Sea Islands are swamps surrounded by swamps. Um, the Sea Islands of South Carolina are a stone's throw from Charleston, which was the biggest slave market in the United States. The, uh, there wasn't much you could do with the Sea Islands, but you could grow indigo and you could grow rice. So the 
slave owners, landowners, would tend to take the slaves out onto the islands and leave them there and just collect up the crops at the end of the year because the owners didn't feel like living amongst mosquitoes and crocodiles and that sort of thing. Pretty inhospitable place. And as a result, the, um, the slaves developed a rather isolated and insulated culture, which some of which persists to this day. Um, but they were very poor and they, and they knew very little. Well, they were very poor and they were very ignorant of the outside world. And they stayed that way for a long time. If, for those of you who, who might not be familiar with the history of race in the United States, slavery was ended with the Civil War, but after a brief effort to reconstruct the country, uh, which, fa which by and large failed, we introduced a system of apartheid in the United States that was, some people have used the term slavery by another name, and that's not far from the mark. Um, so we had a people that was ignorant, by and large, illiterate, very poor, and held in a kind of bondage that wasn't slavery, but was quite rigorous. It was a dark time. Um, there was a man who lived on one of the islands. His name was Esau Jenkins. He was from the island. John's Island is the one I'm particularly talking about right now, if you know that area. But uh, he was from John's Island and was gifted at finding ways to help his community advance. And he teamed up with a woman named Septima Clark. She was a black teacher from South Carolina, from uh, Charleston, South Carolina, who had lost her job. And uh, she lost it because of her involvement in some civil rights activities. She got involved with a school, a thing called the Highlander Folk School, and I'll say more about that in a little while. But the end result was she was shipped off to John's Island to help figure out ways to undermine the disenfranchisement of the local African-American community. And what she and Esau Jenkins cooked up were a thing they called citizenship schools. They built one and they ran it. And I'll, I'll jump ahead on the story a bit. The citizenship school ended up being adopted by the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was Martin Luther King's organization. And that's this idea, which was first cultivated on this little island, which was not much more than swamps and alligators, was, was moved across the American South. It ran from the East Coast all the way to the Mississippi River. And it, was, it provided the uh, grassroots level foundation for the Voting Rights Act. African Americans can effectively vote in the United States because of something that got started by a middle-aged, unemployed black woman in a, what will turn out to be a shed, a cinder block shed on, an, on a swampy island in South Carolina. Now, Septima, the, the, these schools, the, the building, by the way, is still there. It, it was hit by Hurricane Hugo and pretty well knocked down, so you just got some of the cinder blocks. But what they did was they built a cinder block building with a, with a small general store in the front and a hidden, semi-hidden room in the back. That was where they held the classes. It had, it had no windows. But they, they didn't want the whites seeing what they were doing in a nutshell. I've talked to some of the people down there. They used to hold meetings in graveyards because they knew the whites thought that the blacks were afraid of graveyards so they could meet in the graveyards at night and not get caught. Um, the, let me now just say a little bit about the teaching. And this I'm going to read because I think I've done it. I've been able to tighten it up pretty well, so I can cover a lot of ground quickly. Several aspects of Clark's teaching are important. Although she herself was a teacher, she found someone else to do the teaching of adults, her niece, Bernice Reagan. Reagan was a, or, I'm sorry, Bernice Robinson. Robinson was a beautician and as such had a special standing in that community. She also disclaimed being a teacher. Her primary qualifications were that she knew how to listen and respected adults who wanted to vote. She began her first adult education class by saying, I'm not a teacher and we are here to learn together. She discarded children's reading material as too juvenile and used instead the UN Declaration of Human Rights and the South Carolina State Constitution. They developed the curriculum together day by day, writing letters, filling out money orders, making up stories about the vegetables they grew and the like. She created an educational experience for people who were there for their own reasons, one in which they mainly taught themselves 
and they taught themselves what they wanted to learn. Our friend is back. Should I continue? Uh, I'm afraid that we are really over and above our time, uh, yeah. Robert. It's very interesting what you are saying. In well, I'll tell you what, I can wrap it up in about, about a minute. Less, 30 seconds. <laughs> okay, less. Here's, here's the basic idea. You, in order to have the sustainable world, you're going to need a culture of sustainability. And you can't, the culture is not something built from the top down. You'll need teachers who are able to find potential leaders and who can help them cultivate their skills at a grassroots level. And without that, I suspect what we'll get, no matter what we do at the top, is a lot of sand in the gears, as opposed to a culture that is self-moving in a sustainable direction. Thank I'll you, stop. Robert. Pascal, uh, and yeah. I, I asked Janani first, would you confirm that we can show the PowerPoint? And yes. Show yes. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect with me. Okay. Uh, uh, I would yeah. like to keep your intervention five minutes, though, because five minutes. we have some questions. Okay. So, so you will see the, the main point, and I'm sure that our guests, which are really smart on all these issues, will understand. Better. So in the space of the decade, we have experienced two global crises, one financial, another health-related. Uh, uh, while this crisis may appear to be most, almost unrelated, the global nature seems to have implication for crisis exit, their, their global nature constituting matrices for new global crises. Uh, in other words, the way in which the global financial crisis of 2008 was contained played a very direct role in the genesis of the health crisis. Sim similarly, the treatment of the health crisis is likely to create the condition in the short to medium term of further global crisis. So I want in four points, if we have nothing, four points to, to assess this kind of argument. The first point is to come back on the first global financial crisis and its statement, insisting on how much it has emphasis the um, uh, a kind of financial, uh, rigor, uh, financial logic and which has forgotten all what, we, what was learned before. Uh, and we will look at how it has conditioned the other global crisis with open, with the sanitary or the COVID, COVID crisis. Just try to see. Yeah, okay, that's it. Uh, no, uh, let me come back, yes, uh, the risk, uh, the, the third part, the, third po the, the second point, to look at how the vulnerability of countries to pandemic crisis has been increased by uh, what happened in the first place. Finally, we will assess the risk that the various way in which we exist from the sanitary crisis can impact uh, the generation of new countries. The conclusion should help to define new objectives in the social compromise matching with the SDG standards. It's, it's bound to say that what has happened before is, is done in certain contexts for what I call the social compromise prevailing in every country. And if we take that into account, what I will try to do if I have time enough in the fourth point is to see how the transformation of this social compromise to, could help us to go from this kind of basic of the politics in every country towards the SDGs object, SDG standard, which are much more collective in, in various universes that are not so accessible to uh, learning people. So part of my uh, questioning is how we go from politics in one country which is based on this social compromise, whatever they have become in the process of the last, dec of the last five or six decades, uh, to uh, a new compromise which will be concentrating on these SDG goals. It means that 
in these circumstances, we can have a better understanding all through all the countries of how we can deal with this SDG. Uh, while otherwise, as I stress in some point of my demonstration, uh, you, you see that countries are not so much involved in their daily politics practices, are not so much involved in external issues, foreign issues, or issues which have been uh, devoted or designed uh, at the interstate level. It's a kind of dual side of democracy where foreign affairs can be done. One good example I give of that is the fact that in the middle of, in, in somehow around the year um, 2005, um, there was a wide recognition of the risk of pandemics. And according to that, a lot of institution measures have been drawn. There were, it was more, it was, uh, there was a clear warning uh, in that respect. We may, we may drop to the next slide, please. Uh, okay. Uh, so that, that's back to the global financial crisis. I want to insist that uh, exactly like we did with the, sanity, that we experienced with the sanitary crisis, for the global financial crisis of that, everything was kind of peaceful. Uh, firms were confident that things could go on. There was no uh, big fear. It was a, it was a kind of uh, tranquility. And all of a sudden, uh, the accumulation of the underneath transformation, there was what Minsky called, a, a Mins what we call after Minsky, a Minsky moment, and it collapsed. And the, the thing comes so brutally that everything that was learned before is forgotten. And uh, the, the, the decade that followed 2000 is surprising by how much it has continues the globalization of finance, forgetting everything about pandemics and weakening, weakening to an extreme point the health system. What has happened with the health system that they, they discover exactly in a kind of Minsky uh, type, all of a sudden they discover their fragility. They discover that they could not cope with the wave of the pandemic simply because it was not extraordinary, but they were uh, out of, they did not have the capacity to deal, to deal with that. And furthermore, you see all the pressure which have been imposed to all this system. So what I, if, if I can go to the second, uh, next slide, please, yes. Uh, so uh, it's uh, like a, a kind of mi mi Leeds, uh, Minsky moment, a big surprise and a collapse. And here we are in position to say that we have to be very careful to understand why we, uh, shift so rapidly as a, in our politics, in our social compromise, where well, we shift so rapidly to uh, this kind of uh, uh, amnesia. And part of it, as I said, is that in our political life, we don't have enough of these international issues, which we must have on our agenda in a rather globalized world. Can we go to the street so that I keep some chance? Thank you. Uh, on the way out of the health crisis. So what we point is that to the extent that the social compromise in every country is very much first different, a lot of different, but it's very much still anchored on the wage earner status. The very big risk is that once again, we forget everything of what was done before to reconstruct the old world, to solve the unemployment problem rapidly. We don't take the, the, the margin that we need to reconstruct it differently. And an important issue in that respect is to understand how it can be taken on board. How can we reconstruct all that? The good cases are the the reconstruction of all the public services. Most of the populist movement we have seen everywhere in Europe and elsewhere 
are linked with this uh, dissatisfaction, the fact that these public services have lost their value, first value, first mission of the states. That is to say, to respond to some needs. There was no evaluation of the needs of the of or health system. There was simply a financial logic to reduce that. We have to get out of that and to reconsider the way in which these public services can be sharing activities which are market activities, but also non-market activities and domestic activities. That is to say to be much more concerned in a democratic way in the working of, of, of all this. So this is part of uh, what I stress in this third place is that we really need to first go back to the fundamentals of these services and to try to see how to recompose and how we can uh, invest in, in new ways to share these activities. Can we go to the next? Okay, so these are kind of uh, uh, the fi fi final commentary. Uh, this, uh, we, we do realize that we have, first, first of all, where do these SDG come? They come from the recognition of the risk that was taken, the big moment was uh, Paris 2015 with the COP21, where they did realize that there was something coming. But there is a big risk that as it has happened with the health risk in 2005, it, this kind of thing will be kind of forgotten. By, it will not be part anymore of the social compromise. It will reduce their place unless we act decisively in this direction. And to act decisively in this direction, we have to transform or to change the social compromise in all these countries under, under view, which countries which are all different in a way. And I must say that developing countries are very peculiarities way, but they can, it's nearly an advantage in some way, but we have to reconsider that. And what, and what we can do with that it's not to invent a kind of future, it's simply to see that to be proactive uh, or in, in the way the SDGs are supposing, we need simply to let people have more time, to let people have a certified income, guaranteed employment, and so on. So there are a combination of schemes which can uh, enable, enabling people to really take responsibilities in uh, proactively in the development of this uh, sustainable development goal. So I want to I wanted in my expose. I'm very sorry for the rush. Uh, we, 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 to show very well the, the kind of duality between the social compromise and the revolution and the overarching SDGs, which are more complex, which can be at, at uh, uh, which can be uh, addressed in various universe, and we have to understand more and to understand more how, or it's a kind of reconstruction of the citizenship in this new, new, new context. To do that, to do that, we have to get some means, new means, and to orient all this transformation towards this enabling of citizens for them to take part in that. And the scheme- Thank you very much, Pascal, thank you very much. I really appreciated your, oh, yeah. your, your theories and your fantastic presentation. We have it, uh, and we will, of course, share it with, the, with everybody. Uh, we had some technicalities in the beginning, but now everything is in yeah. place. So thank you, Pascal, once more. Uh, thank you for uh, your reconstruction of citizenship and, and the rest of your theories. Uh, now we would. I would like to give the floor to Janani, who kindly she is our administrator for this special session. Uh, she has a couple of questions from the floor. Uh, we had an average of 40, 45 participants following this debate today, so I just find it uh, important to uh, hear their voices as well. Janani. Uh, thank you. There is one question specifically for Professor Schloss how to deal with the countries having various forms of autocratic governments. They have more number of people under them. Some of them 
have military and economic strength. Already, many democratic countries are weak in defending their systems against such opaque governments. With the type of system you have suggested, decision making in many democratic countries could get paralyzed. These UN bodies are also infiltrated by autocratic countries. So how to deal with countries having various forms of autocratic governments for Professor Schloss and for anybody else who would like to take this question, please. Ivo, would you like to answer this question? Uh, you are quite correct. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, the entire paper is just the what one may call uh, uh, another crazy idea. I was well known in the beginning of my mandate as the president to come with various crazy ideas that have later on to be fully developed and really seen what it is. There's a number of problems that exist. My only point here, which is important, is there is much too much power within the sovereign nation states and very frequently they abuse it and particularly when they have the power of veto they can abuse it tremendously thank you Ivo, thank you very much i want to say that we had another uh, highly distinguished panelist but due to to the the, the difference in uh, in time zones could not be with us right now, but we will have his video, a video recorded intervention will be part of our record of this session. He is Winston, Winston Nagan, a professor emeritus, University of Florida, Levin College of Law, and uh, uh, our distinguished fellow. His paper, for those who have not read it yet, is extremely interesting. And the title is Leadership in the United Nations System global constitutionalism, climate change, human needs, and values. Really a must read for all of us. Uh, would you have some, uh, another couple of questions, Janani? I think we are over our allotted time, but uh, okay. thanks to your services and the administration altogether, we can have another 20 minutes for debate if we want okay. to. There is one comment which uh, I would like to read from the, from the attendees. Coercive competitive security is a very good comment. Simultaneously, there is also competitive commercial monopolies whose main motive is to capture all global markets and therefore profits. It also appears that such a monopoly is required for economies of scale. These two competitive strands are intertwined as if in RNA, DNA, need to address it as all countries are caught in these webs and the lives of ordinary people of the world. Any comments? So would anybody like to take this piece? I see Tibor wants to take the floor. Please, Tibor. Um, thank you. Uh, since the uh, phraseology uh, was referenced as a result of my contribution. I, I very much like uh, this um, linking the two concepts of um, how uh, competition might unfold in the security area and how competition might unfold in the economic, financial and, and other areas and where it might lead. And. Um, I think an interesting, an interesting level of looking upon the two together is a similar boom and bust cycle for both of them. Um, even, uh, even I would uh, push it as far as the need to see what are those periods on, of time when the boom and bust cycle of the financial economic life Coincide, coincided or might coincide in the future with the boom and bust cycle, mainly the bust cycle in security. And uh, my, uh, uh, my <clears throat> more uh, conservative uh, look upon the future is stemming uh, from the potential confluence right now 
were on the top of a, a continued um, long um, security um, crisis buildup, we have on the top of that a potential new economic crisis, which in a way is a continuation of the 2008-2009 crisis. And um, the important point is that recovery is not the same in the financial economic areas. It might take four to five years, while in other areas like how people lose faith in the establishment, how people not just lose faith in the establishment, but start rebelling against the establishment, what is unfolding in front of us, might mean to us that we cannot afford too many, uh, too many uh, crises because the too big to fail concept is not just relevant for banks. I think it's relevant for how society as such is looking upon the compact the society expect the state to respect. Okay, so for me, this is the ultimate too big to fail. If, if that level fails, we, we, we might have to really think through where we are going. Okay, so too big to fail uh, for, the, for the compact between the society and the state. And this is what right now shaking as a domino. Thank you, Tibor. Uh, I mean, I would like to use the minutes left that we have. Now we said up to 2.20 is now 2.05. We have 15 minutes left. With two minutes each, if you would like to take in reverse order. So I would start with Pascal uh, to uh, just uh, close in terms of what is your message uh, to take home, which is uh, what are the, your final recommendations? Really, two minutes each. We cannot exceed this time. We start with uh, Pascal, then Robert, and, and now yeah. Pascal. Okay, thank you. I, I will insist simply on the fact that we need to change uh, our practices of politics, not to be uh, more concerned in our national political life by, by international issues. The SDGs give us an opportunity to do that but they need some translation. For example, in Paris, we had, I don't want to quote my own country, but I, we, have, we, have, we are experiencing a, a convention of citizens. Uh, it was done just by, by chance, uh, in a way, Macron at some point said it would be interesting. The situation was totally different. It was in October, but they have been working all together, the citizens, taking uh, very seriously most of the goal, taking very seriously the COP21 uh, objective. And I think it's really, it can make a change, not this experience, but if we have many of them and connection between country, we need to kind of double because of these, uh, very, uh, we need to kind of double all this. Uh, one striking thing in that respect to see how to study the social compromise and what we can do. In my paper, I insist on the importance of the Philadelphia 1944 meeting uh, of ILO, as you know, because basically this is the time when 17 articles and in the final declaration, the only, the, again, one, the 70, 70 articles, they assess rightly the wage labor supremacy, all the, the basic of the welfare state afterwards. And strangely enough, I have discovered that after that, a long time, I looked to see if uh, the European Union had been acting in practice about that. No. This is a core with all the differences among countries, and there was no relying, relaying of this issue by the, by the, which is a weakening, which is an, a factor which has weakened the European Union. And at some point, when you have now this global crisis, the, the attractiveness of Europe has declined. Whether if we had had more in the European agenda, more of the basic of this 1945 conference, things will have been different. 
we won't, we have been too much into this common market. It was supposed to be a short term deal, but little by little, we forget the basic. So let's go to the basic and the basic this time, the new big Philadelphia continent is worldwide and it will be around this objective, but not directly so. It has to be, it has to taken into account where do we all come from, from this nationalist come from. Simply, we have to double or to make, to, to install new political practices. And for that, we need some time and all that. That's what I said. The traditional tools, if I may say so, some uh, basic income, free access to some services, can be Complementary monies are also important for this independence. Sorry, it's too much. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. Robert, two minutes, please. You have to un unmute yourself, Robert. Unmute yourself. Thank you. I won't need two minutes. Um, we live in the period of um, systemic problems with no systemic solutions. In such a period, there is no serious prospect for governance by experts because way too few people have a shred of confidence in either the wisdom or the character of those experts. The only solution I know of to that is to begin to cultivate a new capacity within what I'll call the general population, but it won't be everybody. It'll be those who have the brains and the courage and the stamina for the problems for, for addressing the problems that are about to befall us. I, I see the rest of my time. Very kind and, and very punctual intervention. Uh, the next to speak is, uh, uh, is Tibor. Tibor, please. Um, yes, um, coming back to the notion of uh, putting our eggs in as many baskets as possible, uh, distributing the efforts to manage uh, what might be a very complex period ahead of us. I think it's extremely important, not just globally, but in Europe as well, that we preserve multilateralism in addition to globalism. Uh, we follow the principle of just do it. So in many organizations, there is no need to start new codifications to start uh, requesting for new mandates, okay? The organizations should withstand the pressure. They are exposed right now in the middle of this crisis. They should retain their integrity. They shouldn't be threatened by whatever threats might be coming in terms of, in terms of head of organizations, in terms of the um, uh, uh, members of the staff in terms of budget and mandate and so on. So this is critical time. I think we need a spine in those organizations because right now more cooperation is needed instead of less cooperation. And we have to counteract this concentration of power. Countries beyond the first 10, 15 countries cannot on their own withstand what might be coming in terms of pressures from others. So in this time of potential bullying, uh, there is an additional reason that in United we prevail. So that's, that's my strong message. You muted another. Donata, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, I have muted myself. Sorry, Alexander, it's your turn. Sorry. Thank, Thank you. you, Donata. I was just waiting for your announcement. Yeah, it would never come because I have erroneously. Listen, muted. well, I, I will be very brief. Uh, you know, 2000 years ago, the entire Pax Romana was doomed like a dinosaur because its brain was too small for such a huge body. Our current world system and governance system have similar constraints today. We have today 5.1 billion unique mobile users in the world. Financial decisions are being taken and 
trillions of dollars just switched before Europe, Asia, America, and uh, Australia in a one second less than. And the current system of global governance cannot work at these speeds. Therefore, today's circumstances call for an updated operating system. You can call it effective multilateralism, plurilateralism, and I'm not inviting to scrap what we used before by simply, I'm simply saying that we cannot continue using this system as the only one network for taking the decisions and we need to recruit the creative capacity of the very broad sections of public. Thank you. Well, Donato, thank you we can't much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Alexander. Uh, Rama, please. Thank you. Yes. Well, it's lovely to be here with all of you, but also to have the joy of following my dear colleague Alexander on the work World Future colleague uh, of the World Future Council. You know what's fabulous about this panel is all of us have agreed what Alexander just underlined and, and Tibor before him is we are all agree that we need to go beyond what we have. But as Tibor, you said, you know, to use the opportunities of the old while we build the new and all of our interventions have really suggested what are some of the ways to build the new and who are the people, meaning that this time we the people, civil society, the examples you referred to, Alexander, they will be at the front lines and not at the sidelines or outliers, you know, who've been uh, thrown out of the redesign of global governance because they are the ones who have these new capacities of transformative leadership. And there, I didn't get a chance to mention, but the obvious ones, you know, the women's movement, the youth movements, especially for climate change, justice, and democracy, the indigenous movements, city mayors who linked across continents going beyond their federal or national rules, a few national leaders, and of course, indeed, a few UN officials and diplomats. So, and we have these innovative ways that, that these social movements have used, which will complement what we need to draw on the governance practices and knowledges of our indigenous people and ancient uh, cultures. So, the, you know, bringing the two together to shape the future. But I think the huge challenge for all of us, knowing what we know, that we need to be building the new because Tibor, you are so right. We are in the eye of the storm and we've passed all the red lines is we are building the new what are we going to do about this transition? It's always a question about what is it that enables us to move out of the P5 stranglehold, out of the economic stranglehold, which is pulling us back to the old normal, which caused this disaster. And Pascal, vous l'avez dit si bien, you said it so well, how the financial crisis response created this, and we are doing it again. So this will be the big thing. How can we get all of these creative minds to think, how do we unplug from the old system, which is not uh, renewable energy, that's depleting energy into the new systems which are here while drawing the best out of them and taking the best out of them into the continuity of what will be regenerative. Thank you. Thank you, Rama, thanks a lot. And now to conclude, Ivo. I waive the rights of the moderator to conclude, so up to the honorary president uh, to conclude this debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was actually a great honor and pleasure to participate in this panel. Uh, all the contributions were outstanding. And I will just conclude with one sentence. In various um, scientific disciplines, we know more, in some we know less. Uh, never we know as much as it is needed. But your discussion actually, and our discussion and contribution showed that much more is needed in terms of politics. Indeed, Aristotle was right. It is the master science and we have to work much, much more than what we have accomplished now. Thank you very much for giving me the honor to participate. Thank you very much for being with us and leading this wonderful debate. So thank you all again. Thanks to Ivo, thanks Rama, Tibor, Pascal, Robert, and Alexander.
and of course the administration that helped us a great deal also to sort out the technical hiccups. Uh, please we'll thank you, Donato. Thank you, Janani. And, uh, and please remember that we have Winston, uh, Winston presentation that we could not show due to the time limits, but will be part of uh, part and parcel of this discussion. Correct? Yes, it will be on the website. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Bye.